All right, great. Well, welcome everyone to our first of many sessions discussing how manufacturers can increase profit by revamping their FP&A processes. Today, we'll discuss navigating the delicate balance between reducing costs and meeting customer demands in a very increasing complex environment. Now, sticking with the Halloween theme, the spooky reality is that outdated FP&A solutions are costing manufacturers up to 50% of profits, which is extravagant. Today is packed with a tremendous amount of knowledge from a leading expert in the field, Dean Sorensen. He will speak about best practices, common trends, misconceptions in the market. In addition, you'll briefly be introduced to a new revolutionary technology solution for FP&A that eradicates the inefficiencies as well as elevates your enterprise to the next level. Now, just a few housekeeping items that I want to discuss before we begin. Everyone will be muted throughout today's presentation. However, if you do have any questions, feel free to uh, include those in the chat on the right-hand side of the screen in the GoToMeeting um, panel. There should be a question box that you can enter that question into. We will be monitoring these questions throughout today's presentation, and we will respond towards the tail end of the discussion. So once again, wanna thank everyone for your time today. Let's begin. So for the topics to today, there's a lot of things that we're gonna be going through. I'm not gonna go through this slide in detail, but it does give you a very comprehensive overview of what Dean is going to discuss along with Richard, who is going to provide some real life experiences. We'll go into details around budgeting and rolling forecasting, reducing, uh, reducing costs, as well as increasing automation across the various teams and creating more of a collaborative type of environment revamping that FP&A process that you may have today and helping organizations get to a point where they can actually trust the data that is in front of them to make those strategic business decisions, as well as understanding some cross-functional trade-off decisions, because as we all know, we have day-to-day -day jobs and we can't do everything at once. But what are some of the key things that we could take away from today's session that we can instantly implement along with a longer term vision of what we can do to achieve our strategic goals? When we think about automation, one of the biggest key elements of automation is technology and implementing the right technology for the right firm. Actaris 360 IBP offers a cohesive platform that covers the entire organization and keeping everything in one common ecosystem being the Microsoft ecosystem. So on this diagram, this is just articulating the process of how we can consume data and get you to a point of actually trusting your data to make those strategic business decisions. So starting at the very bottom of this chart, we have different integration sources that we can pull data from. It's all about grabbing that information and consolidating it in a single source of truth. That's what you have in the middle, which is the actual engine that all of this data is gonna be flowing through to recalculate the data and provide it in a more visual front end tool like Power BI and Excel to really bring the data to life. Now the Actaris technology also allows you to interact with that data, providing real time simulation on the backs of Power BI and Excel. So being able to instantly write back data from the Power BI interface back to a single source of truth, updating that uh, information to make those strategic business decisions. So being able to change things like, well, what if certain things happen within the business? Being able to plan for the future. That's what Actaris is all about. Planning and helping teams plan in a more effective, efficient, and smart way. We have about eight custom visuals built in the Microsoft ecosystem that you can download directly within the Power BI reports. And it's really revolutionizing the industry because it's allowing people to use fairly common tools that, they are, that teams are already leveraging today being Power BI Excel. And that's what Actaris is really striving for is repurposing what you currently have, but being able to provide a tremendous amount of value based on the engine, which is the core of the technology that we'll be talking about today. Now, the last thing that I want to mention before I hand it over to Dean to really give you some in-depth industry knowledge about the topic at hand today is the fact that Actaris 360 IBP has signed a global partnership with Microsoft 
This is a great collaboration between two wonderful firms. What this is going to allow Microsoft and the Microsoft community to achieve is really real-time instant visibility into their data. So we've licensed, Actaris has licensed our technology to now be included in the Dynamics FNO, their flagship ERP system. So it's a great initiative to really get this technology in the hands of many, many more organizations to help them solve some of the biggest challenges that they're facing today. So without further ado, I'm extremely excited to introduce Dean, who is a leading expert in the field and is going to really revolutionize your thought process of how to revamp FP&A and help increase profits and reduce costs. Dean? Thanks, Mike. So um, just to build off what Mike was saying, I believe that what you're going to see today really is something that's very different than what you've seen before. Uh, it really does speak to the whole revolutionizing uh, processes by way of integration. I think and people talk a lot about integration, but I think what we're going to show you today is a little bit beyond what uh, many of you may have experienced. So what, one of the things I want to be able to take away uh, when we're at the end is that we can drive some significant process improvements via integration. So collapsing budgeting down to less than a month, integrating rolling forecasts and IBP and collapsing the cycle time. But at the same time, reducing your total costs of planning and managing from both a financial and operational perspective by up to 50%. We're going to show you what activities actually go away because of this integration. And as well, we'll talk about how the processes we're uh, speaking about enable more effective costs and profitability management. And one of the key things is that um, the process enables cost structures to self-adjust to change so that they deliver your target profits. So gone are the days are kind of doing special cost reduction studies. So how do you make sure that your costs are always in line with your revenue streams? And the value of such a, a process, and we'll talk about where these numbers came from as well, can be up to 5% of sales, which is fairly significant. And we're also, uh, the solution that we're gonna be talking about and the process can actually help you self-fund this in three to six months. So here's how we're going to go through this. So first off, I want to just talk about just the challenges relating to profitability management, just at a quick and high level. Then um, I want to talk about um, the, um, give you an overview in the small, small manufacturer and how, uh, how the process would work. We then get into a more complex manufacturer and talk about what the differences are and what it is that we're bringing that's different. Then talk about performance management, what's different there and how that drives value. Then I'll talk about it, the process and how we use that process to collapse cycle time. But then I've got a practitioner on uh, that's gonna speak. He, he uh, is gonna provide some insight in terms of the integration between finance and ops and the, uh, some of the challenges it addresses. Uh, we'll talk about you know things that you can think about in terms of getting started on this and we'll leave some time for uh, questions at the end. So one of the things, if you uh, follow what Gartner's talking about, you know, if you look at um, this research study uh, and the top five items are shown on the right, that, so profitability and cost management are some of the big things that CEOs are expecting of CFOs these days. But the challenge is that as organization gets larger or more complex, the reality is that neither FP&A nor integrated business planning solutions are really fulfilling that. There's some gaps. So three of the main ones are, you know, we still have functional silos in our processes. When you get into more complex situations, the planning models are often wrong and they don't enable effective cost and profitability management. And much of this um, is driven by the fact that, you know, you have an increasing proportion of overhead costs, which really aren't supported well in these solutions. And, you know, if you look at a lot of companies these days, one of the problem, larger companies, one of the uh, things that you see most often is that they still can't do direct cash flow forecasting and they still can't do scenario planning. So you get into bigger companies where they say, you know, we talk about doing enterprise wide scenario planning. You know, most times when I talk to company that that's really a myth. You know, so you can do some basic scenarios, but you know, anything that's really kind of complex is still on spreadsheets. So 
This is a little bit different than what you might have been hearing from, you know, Gartner. Um, and just to make a distinction, what Gartner's really taught, they're looking and evaluating software in specific industries. They're not looking at, you know, enterprise integration. So they're, they're just different perspectives. But when you look at it from a business perspective, you know, one of the things I see is that the uh, the solutions are really not that not that sophisticated. And I'm going to talk about what the what the differences are. Uh, and there's four. When we go through, there's going to be four things I'm going to um, identify. So obviously, there's a lot of technology differences underneath. But from a business perspective, there's four things that are really driving uh, the value difference. And I'll, I'll point those out when we get there. So that's the issue at a high level. So, you know, the, this gap in uh, profitability management. Let's dig into that a little bit. So on the screen here, I've summarized a bunch of research studies that I've come across. And I'm not going to go over all of them. But basically what it shows is that, you know, it's not a really pretty picture. So, you know, we talk about all these great and wonderful things that we're doing, but the reality is that, you know, things like digital transformation, cost reduction, you know, we're we're not doing it all that well. So, but you know, what's common to all these things is that each and every one of these things, when you get into big organizations, rely on the ability to plan and manage outcomes across functions and entities. And that's really not something that either FP&A nor IBP solutions are addressing. So, you know, this whole idea of managing outcomes is really central to digital and finance transformation. It's one of these things that are kind of falling between the gaps. So when we think about managing profitability, there's kind of four things that you need to have. You need to have accurate models, cross-functional alignment, all these different things. These need to be in place. And of course, you need to have ownership of profitability and effective governance structure. Now, here's the problem. You know, you know, I've been I've done lots of profitability analytics um, over the years, and one of the things that you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of profitability analyses shows you that these things have never existed. Um, and the the problem is that we've never really fixed the problem. So if you look at FP&A vendors and IBP vendors, uh, the same problems that were there, you know, 20, 30 years ago, have never been fixed. So you know, when I talk to IB, you know, uh, IBP and FP&A vendors, one of the things they talk about is, uh, well, we have an ABC system to help. But, you know, what's implicit in these statements is that they're implicitly assuming that if you fix the wrong decisions after the fact, it will result in the same value. And to me, that's just, you know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. You know, of course, there's some other assumptions that they built in, but this is the main one that I think is really not, um, not valid. Now. You'll see some research studies that I've, uh, both from McKinsey and Gartner. One of the things I talk about is uh, one of the major problems that organizations can't make cross-functional trade-off decisions. And this is really uh, the same problem that we had you know, relating to activity-based costing and where some of the problems were occurring. And where these uh, problems really occur and, and where the uh, cost and pro performance issues start is in when you uh, introduce change like new products, customers, suppliers. And one of the biggest questions that most companies still can't answer is how do new products, customers, and uh, suppliers, how do they affect cash flow? And, you know, because we haven't really had the models to answer these questions, you know, we're making a lot of bad decisions. And what that leads to is the cost of complexity. And you'll see a couple of research studies down here at the bottom. And, you know, there's other ones out there, but the these are really uh, in line what I've seen, like when I've done, like I say, activity-based costing. These, these numbers are consistent with the types of value erosion that uh, we've experienced. Now, one of the things I saw in, um, you know, what Gartner was talking about um, this year, this whole idea of managing trade-offs in one of their conferences you know, if you look at the sort of things that, you know, companies are having difficulty with, and I'll let you read these at, at your leisure, but, you know, this whole idea of managing the trade-offs that I mentioned before is, is a huge one and navigating planning complexity because, you know, if you look at the FP&A tools that are out there, you know, if you try to tackle um, some of these uh, challenges of managing in a global business, 
uh, I think there's some um, uh, difficulties with the with the with the tools. So there, and as well, I don't uh, uh, necessarily see them being as kind of the key drivers of good finance transformation. And I'm going to get into the details of why that is, but. The key takeaway in this slide is that one of the things that we're talking about and the capabilities that we're going to be discussing are highly relevant to the things that are kind of topical to uh, some of the things that Gartner's discussing. And the main one, you're going to see me kind of point this out a few times, is this whole idea of managing trade-offs. So if you want to optimize um, performance, you need to have some mechanism to do so. The reality is that when you really think about it, you know, most companies don't really have formal mechanisms for doing that and, and aligning people through the organization. And this is one thing, and I'll point it out as we go through as to how we do that. So given that as a starting point, let me just talk about a small manufacturer. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to point out here is that, you know, when I talk to kind of operationally savvy CFOs, and Greg here is a guy that I know very well, but uh, these these guys tend to have a different view on um, you know what are best practices. So when I, he, by the way, you can see is the quote that he gave me over uh, on the right. But typically, you know, when we say things like um, you know rolling forecasts and integrated planning are really the same process. Not everybody agrees with that, but anybody who's done kind of FP&A work you know, sales and operations planning, activity-based costing, you know, I never get a pushback on this stuff because everybody sees the same thing. So if you're kind of an operationally savvy CFO, one of the things you're gonna know, there's no way in hell that you're gonna be able to do really good direct cash flow forecasting without a supply chain model, not gonna happen. There are at least bills and routings. You know, so when you think about it right out of the box, fp &A tools, uh, I think, you know, the vast majority don't have these tools. So, you know, these general purpose tools really aren't supporting the needs of manufacturers. So what we're talking about here with this solution is uh, one FP&A and SNOP solution sharing the same models, measures, you know, all these different structures. They're sharing um, the same different model, like demand planning, inventory parameters. So one of the things that's uh, uh, want to make sure that we understand here is that the solution um, and process we're talking about is that supported by Actaris, there's absolutely no difference between FP&A and SNOP. What's more, the SNOP solution is an IBP solution is a very mature one that has capabilities that are, you know, equally as good, if not better than most of the IBP solutions on the market. And what's also different is that, you know, the solutions finance and ops share, you know, descriptive, prescriptive, uh, predictive and uh, analytics, as well as multi echelon inventory optimization. So very mature capability. So the main thing that I, what, what I have in front of you here is really a, a, something I did for a client, but, um, but what this basically shows is that an integrated financial and operational process, so rolling forecasts and SNOP, so you take the demand, um, throw it into a model, Calculate um, calculate the requirements, and mo for small companies, most of that is in the uh, you know the direct resources, so bills and routings, that kind of thing. You'll have less in the operational ones because their uh, overhead costs are usually lower. And what comes out of it is all the uh, traditional things that you would expect, as well as you know product and customer profitability, which are activity based, and direct cash flows. So with that same embedded model, um, you know, really what you've got um, in the in the platform is four solutions in one. So it's a pretty powerful statement to be able to say all these things are coming in one tool and one platform. Uh, what's more, you know, you can use the tool for different things. So this happened to be a food and packaged goods um, company, and they happen to use the model to do both you know, new product uh, introduction and quotation. So take the new product, new customer, put it in the model, figure out how does that affect my cash flow. That's a pretty big deal. And we'll show you how we can we can actually do that in larger companies as well. And then when you um, attach that with kind of the power apps, you know, there's a number of different sort of uh, uh, add-on type of um, processes one could support, especially with kind of new product and quotations. 
So one of the things here, when you look at this um, integrated process, these are the sorts of activities that go away. So in small companies, this may not be huge, a uh, big thing, but in big companies, these numbers get really big. And in fact, the numbers can be big enough so that the savings that you get from these things going away can actually pay for the uh, pay for the solution. And one of the key things that's that's different is that you know within the solution we use uh, what um, these data driven processes. And I know that data driven is a term that many people use, but there's some things in here which uh, I think are uh, really quite different. So, for example, the ability to automatically cal calculate variances and uh, automatically create your planning models. So the key takeaway here from a small manufacturing perspective is that it's, you know, m you know, can be much cheaper uh, or, um, and more cost effective, you know, less risk because it's built on, on the Microsoft uh, platform. And this value can get even greater when you're using Microsoft Dynamics ERP. And that's a kind of a deeper subject that we could go into at another point. So let me now get into complex planning. And so what's different in a big company? So the first thing I want to raise is, you know, I work, used to work for a, a prescriptive analytics software company called Genova many years ago. They're, they're no longer around. But the main thing I wanted to point out was, you know, the, the savings that we, uh, that we provided companies. You know, I think the least we ended up providing was like $100 million. Uh, we had a couple of clients that were more than a billion. And one of the biggest things to take away uh, from this slide is that when you get into big companies, you know, most companies are still planning in silos. All the FP&A tools really plan in silos. And the thing is, when in multiple, in large companies that have cross, uh, cross entity uh, value propositions, you cannot help but sub-optimize. You know, so right off the bat, I think FP&A tools, just by their very nature, are sub-optimizing resource allocation. And we found that in, in a number of cases. So on now, what I would like to do is just talk about, you know, the, the model, like this is the model, uh, like a, a, a depiction of the model that was in the um, Genova tool. And this is the same sort of thing that we built into our application. So for small manufacturers, we're only using kind of the bills and the materials, you know, something very simple, but you know, you're, you're just not, you, you don't really always you need to have the rest. But you know, a couple of things to make, uh, to be aware of. So one of the main things is that what this, what the tool is actually doing is actually um, looking at streams. So, so in this case, you know, if you do the math, there's 2.1 million potential streams here are, uh, of um, of cost, if you are resource consumption, but the main thing here is that if you look at you know if you had ninety percent of the volume going here, ten there, and then that turns into fifty percent down here, you know when you change these, it automatically changed down there. And this is you know anybody who's been in manufacturing and um, who understands the idea of volume and mix variations, this is a huge problem because you can get you can get things wrong pretty fast. So. What, what we're essentially doing here is simulating a business within a business. That's really what the tool does. Um, and it's providing far greater insight than you're gonna get anywhere in any traditional financial planning tool. And, you know, and it's, you know, you're, you're incorporating these sorts of things that are, uh, you're probably aware of. Vastly superior cash flow forecasting and product and customer profitability. So the, the ability to actually look at these streams of, of costs and resource consumption is, is absolutely critical because if you don't have it, the likelihood of your profitability numbers being right is pretty slim. So the one thing from a FP&A perspective to think of, if you've ever worked with FP&A tools, one of the things you find is that, um, you know, even for the best tools, you know, you're into it for three to six months to learn how to effectively you build like a, an okay model. You know, from uh, just from a learning perspective, you know, the thing thing that's uh, really uh, innovative here is that we can teach people how to use this model in less than a day. Uh, so it's highly flexible and adaptable to change. So one of the main things that we're doing here is we're planning both accounts and activity level 
Uh, it's an all embedded logic and it's owned by the departments. And basically what you're trying to do is identify how resource consumption varies by product and customer. And one of the things that also is that it's analytics ready. So when you're planning at that level of activity means that now we can use our, our uh, embedded analytics. And there's two types of analytics that are embedded into this tool. One is this prescriptive analytics it's based on evolutionary computation. It's a subfield of artificial intelligence. This thing is highly sophisticated. And, you know, you know, if you, one of the things it's doing, it's allowing you to look at when you're doing optimization, look at us like a surface of trade-off options. And, you know, I could spend an hour just talking about this, but this is very sophisticated and ready to be used. You don't have to redo your models. It's all ready to go. <clears throat> and the second thing that's built into the tool is, probabilistic forecasting, not just at a demand planning level, but for financial planning as well. So these, if you look at these, these um, uh, probability distributions, they're built in not, in not only into demand, but they're also built into the financials. So if you just look at you know, the sorts of things that I would expect to have in an integrated planning tool, one of the things I'm finding is that, you know, you know, the things that you need really to do integrated planning just don't exist in FPA, traditional FPA and uh, IBP solutions. Uh, there's just some huge gaps, especially when it comes to doing product customer profitability, direct cash flow, and, you know, just from a, 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 a supply chain planning perspective, you know, most of these tools are really only covering 50 to 60% of your cost structure anyway, but the IBP tools, um, you know, they're just, uh, not broad enough to uh, to address other parts of the business. Plus, the other thing that we're bringing is uh, the ability to share prescriptive analytics with finance. And if you you know, when I look at the FP&A tool, to me, a really good FP&A tool at the end of the day ought to be doing um, treasury optimization. So I have you know, because that should be cash flow should be a key output. It should be able to. You know, when I run a scenario, I should be able to figure out how cash is going to behave and utilize that um, uh, the output. And that's just not happening. You know, if you look at most of the FBA tools, I see very few even having a, a, a vision to how they're going to get the prescriptive analytics. So the big thing here, takeaway here is that, you know, we're able to support integrated scenarios, complex planning and the analytics integration, then to me, it's kind of a big difference between you know, what's out there today and what we're able to support. Um, performance management. Now, one of the things you, uh, when I talk to FP&A folks, you know, they, they, they find uh, integrated planning as just kind of your traditional uh, income statement, balance sheet and cash flow. But I look at it a little bit differently because if you really want to drive um, you know, performance improvement in a company, you need to have uh, operational income statement, which is essentially looking at it by business process and activity. You need to be able to show how that then translates into customer profitability. And you need to be able to take, you know, the SNOP and IBP and translate that into a cost of goods and manufacturer. And of course, that most tools can't do that. Uh, and one of the other things that you need to have are um, these three things here, which are kind of some very incremental capabilities that we talked about at the very beginning and how these drive process improvements. Let me just talk about that for a sec. So these are basically things that you might look at on a screen. Like the, these are sort of outputs. So the one thing I would expect, I should be able to uh, reconcile my traditional financial view, uh, accounts to business processes, and then say for an order to cash process, I should be able to look at this on a cost per order. Um, you know, and I could look, I should be able to look at it by segment and then add into that, you know, the trade offs that are driving it. Now, this is where this sort of framework, uh, one of the things it does, this is where we start looking at how to manage costs. So if you look at this slide, so by, say, reducing perfect order fulfillment rates, I can reduce the overall rate uh, cost per order to $12. So you see that you should be able to see these uh, differences as you start um, changing uh, um, uh, the um, this perfect order rates. Now, these sorts of trade-offs are not built into financial tools. 
you know, in order to do this, you have to have some pretty detailed drivers that can provide you this kind of insight. This is not what you're going to get out of an FP&A tool. So this is a pretty big one. So when you're starting to use analytics to find cost reduction opportunity, this is a big one. Now, as you're doing that, one of the outputs is that um, it also helps you plan um, resource consumption. So this is basically the same thing as you would get into a supply chain tool. It's basically the same methodology. Now, one of the reasons why you might want to have this, if you read this article from Harvard, that companies who can do this have operating margins that are 30 to 50 percent higher. So that in and of itself is one reason why you want to do this. Now, I also did a research study many a number of years ago for CFO magazine, and I put this graph in front of um, you know a bunch of what I would call pretty savvy FP&A guys uh, for a food and packaged goods company, and they said that. Um, this capability would be worth for at least $400 million a year to $1.2 billion because they said, really, nobody's managing this. You know, so if you look at you know, the order to cash process, you might have a process owner, but nobody's really managing it. So just from a cost structure alignment perspective, what you're trying to do is take you know, targets at the top of the enterprise translate those down into your uh, business processes. And as part of this, you know, one of the things you're, you're doing is you're managing these trade-offs up and down the hierarchy. And in so doing, one of the things that you're doing is you're kind of operationalizing how balanced scorecards are connected to um, uh, the rest of the operation. And, you know, this whole, um, Connecting objectives down to business process is central to doing things like ESG, integrated reporting and thinking. You can see this trade-off, um, the trade-offs is a key component of it. So that's a building block for the integrated process. And one of the things I want to cover off here, like what does the process look like and how does it drive, you know, fast and responsive processes? So I'm not going to go through each of these um, uh, steps here, but one of the things that we're, uh, I wanted to make, make you aware of is that there's a process within the solution, as well as that we're able to collapse the process by having uh, these concurrent processes or in doing um, a lot of these activities simultaneously rather than sequentially. And you know we're operating this. One of the big things that we're doing is that you can do is you can operate this process across legal entities, which is a huge deal if you're, um, you know, a global company. So one of the main things, like when I take this, uh, when I look at this process, you're able to kind of look at it in three chunks, like your review performance and forecast demand calculate your requirements because you have one model where you can actually just hit the calc button. It'll tell you what you need across the company. And then uh, once you've done that, you can align your portfolio. So this whole idea of aligning the portfolio is that, you know, you, you, you do the initial calculation and if you're not getting the profitability you need, then you can go backwards and figure out, well, where can we, we uh, become more efficient or can we reduce service levels to ensure that, um, we achieve our target margins. And this is kind of an active component of a process where you're engineering your cost structure on, an, on a continuous basis. Um, and as part of this as well, um, you, know, you know, for those of you involved in kind of integrated planning, this would, you, this would be the supply plan, if you will. So one of the things that actually allows you to kind of collapse this process is the ability to uh, distribute models and reconcile them to financials. So this one step in here is really kind of your departmental uh, budgeting and forecasting, if you will, but connected to ongoing processes. And just as an example, I mean, the way the, the um, conversation ought to go between finance and ops uh, is, you know, if I'm a department manager, you need to tell me like, the model can tell you how much is work, work is coming at me. And then you can derive how many people do I need and what are the assumptions? So these are the graphs I showed you before. And then what then you can derive your financial forecast. And one of the things that's a key to actually doing this um, is making sure that people are not being evaluated on fixed budgets. But 
you know, I've done this on many occasions, but in one case, I took the um, the elapsed cycle time for, you know, a fairly significant part of the organization from 10 weeks to two days. One of the reasons why we're able to do this, if you look on the left hand side, you know, there's a book written called The Unwritten Rules of the Game. I mean, um, I think that whenever I go into companies, um, you know, whenever I throw this up in a live audience, you know, people typically um, uh, chuckle because they know it's happening in their organizations. And one of the reasons why it's happening is because people don't believe your, your processes are fair. Um, and you're really not managing on uh, managing people's expectations. So um, one of the things that, uh, by fixing this and using the process that we suggested that you're really getting people to focus on, you know, the right targets and forecasts the first time and open and honest dialogue. And what that drives is, uh, you know, real culture change, if you will, some real behavior change. Plus, you know, provides a foundation for more effective employee engagement. Uh, and lastly, one of the things that um, uh, that the process does is that it's actually driven by profits, uh, and um, the profits are actually owned across the organization. So, one of the things that I saw this research study from Grant Thornton that basically said, "Who owns profitability in your company?" And this is one of the reasons why some of these numbers are so low, because most companies are still managing margins. You know, you get the big glob of overhead costs that people, you know, attack uh, every, you know, every few years. So rather than managing 40 to 60 percent of your cost structures through, uh, you know, um, a, um, a, a business unit, you're actually managing 60 to 80 percent of your cost structure. And that's one of the key drivers for improving profitability. And this is especially important when you're managing uh, business units across multiple multiple legal entities, because in effect, you know, you're again, you can't run a business within a business. So the key takeaway here is that the process and the changes that we're uh, we're suggesting um, enable fast and market responsive processes that meet the needs of finance and ops. So this is and it enables this kind of self-adjusting cost structure I talked about before. So let me, uh, I'm just going to uh, introduce Richard here. And um, Richard, I've known for many years, and he's probably one of the most uh, financially savvy operational people I've run across. And one of the things that I thought it would be helpful just to get his perspective on what a process ought to look like um, from, an op from, operational, from an operational perspective and from a financial perspective. So Richard, uh, are you there? Yep, can you hear me, Dean? Yep, so why don't you just kind of give us some thoughts on this and uh, uh, oh, sure. we'll just let you go on with it there. Sure, I can uh, go through the bullet list here. Right? The first one I've got there is, you know, what, what should an IBP process look like, right? First one is people sharing the same screen. Uh, <laughs> well, what I like to tell you, if IBP's do, done right, um, I call it the, the holy grail of IVP would be a demand manager, a supply manager, and a financial analyst all looking over each other's shoulder at the same screen, right? The demand manager making tweaks to this is what we this is this is what we could we, we choose to sell. This is who we choose to sell it to. The supply manager making tweaks. This is what I choose to uh, produce. This is how I choose to produce it. And a financial analyst looking at them as they do that, saying, "Okay." Uh, each of the, you know, almost instantaneously saying, here is the financial impact of those decisions you guys are making, right? And um, uh, the key output of that, really, of that, you know, if you had to model, you could end-to-end -end model your supply chain, the key output of that is cash flow. And cash flow is what a company uses to fund its business and to grow its business. So every decision I make in my IVP process I ought to have a direct impact on well, what's what's it doing to my cash flow for the next 24 to 36 months, right? Um, challenges of getting there throughout my career is you know the, the IBP process, like you said earlier, Dean, it's sequential. Um, the technology supporting that is is pretty disparate too, right? I I have. Um, and IBP solutions that we've implemented in the past it has been. Um, 
individual software solutions that we cobble together, right? I have a demand planning tool. First week of every month, um, demand team goes through a forecasting tool or you know, a, they, they develop a sales plan. End of that week, they toss that sales plan across over the fence to the supply chain. Supply chain has some kind of uh, linear uh, equation solver, master production scheduler, they take that demand plan and a week later they spit out, okay, well, here is, uh, here's what we're going to produce. Here's resulting inventory. Uh, all the um, um, gaps between, well, we can't supply to this demand. Well, they're, they just pushed off, uh, gathered, pushed off and uh, talk, you know, we'll talk about resolving it in the next cycle. Uh, once supply is done, supply sends the, the supply plan over to uh, finance. Finance is looking at the original demand plan. They're looking at the supply plan, and they're trying to um, dollarize it and come out with, okay, well, here's here's our financial reports based on that. Your, fi your finance group will make large changes at the top to operating COGS, manufacturing COGS, big adjustments. Uh, to get to a number that they want to commit to. Um, problem is that uh, while well, they're doing that in the financial system, those decisions they're making, they're never executable. They're never actionable down to the point, right? Uh, they'll, they'll take, um, I'll take sales up 10%. Uh, take my uh, conversion costs down 5%. Well, there's no actions behind that. Uh, when we get to the next cycle, it'll be, well, all I know is I've got to find 5% more volume or I've got to uh, cut cost at a certain plant X percent. Uh, that gets to an executive meeting, uh, pre-SNOP and an executive meeting. You get the executive meeting, and I don't know how many times I've sat in an executive meeting where we present a demand plan, and the CEO or the CFO or the head of commercial will say, well, wait a minute, that's not, that's not the demand plan we just agreed to. Right? That, that thing's three, four weeks old. That's not the plan we agreed to. We made these changes. What's the impact of these changes? They're looking at a supply plan that's based on a wrong demand plan. And they're looking at, well, here's my projected inventory. And well, none of that's based on, on current plans. Um, so Richard, mind yeah. if I, ask, I mean, so what I'm hearing is, you know, what we're calling integrated today um, in a lot of cases is, you know, would be a stretch to call it really integrated. It, uh, it is. Yeah, I would, and I, I've had this argument with a lot of the vendor providers out there. You, you know, you don't call it an integrated solution if I have a demand manager who has to have three different logins into three different systems. Um, if I can't sit in a room, those three people can't sit in a room looking at the same computer screen doing scenarios, right? I want to I want to come in with a base case, I want to come in with a best case, I want to come in with a worst case, and I want to be able to live tweak that, tweak that through uh, a supply model. The supply model ought to be spitting out my financial variances, right? Every time I make a change at supply model, supply and the financial model ought to be one of the same model. But I ought to be able to say, uh, well, look, if I uh, if I in a decreased lead time for this, what's the impact on my inventory investment? Um, if I um, if I move, if I decide to uh, produce at an offshore product, well, what is the impact to my uh, operating costs? What does that do to my transportation costs? So we ought to be able to do that in a couple of days, not yeah. in a four or five week period. So just the last thing I wanted to get here, um, you know, one of the things I talked about were uh, cross-functional trade-off decisions and how they could, uh, they, how they cause complexity costs. Could you just comment on how you've experienced that? Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, we, um, I mean, I've been in situations. Uh, we'll, um, we're short on demand, and we'll launch a big project. Well, we're going to go out. We've got to get the demand back, uh, and we'll do some kind of large program. Um, launch that program, but then when we get to the supply side, well, wait a minute, we can't uh, we can't supply that, right? I don't have the capacity to do that, or well, in order to do that, I've got to expedite. I've got to add all these uh, accessorial fees in. Um, 
the cost structure will change, right? All these decisions we make in the meeting about we're going to take, we're going to, we're going to try and do this in order to either grow sales, cut costs. Well, you said earlier, all the unintended consequences of these trade-offs, right? The things that we're not modeling. Um, When we get, when we get down to, we're actually delivering, we go, well, okay, we, we increased sales, but my costs went through the roof. Uh, right. We cut costs. Well, now I'm losing sales because I'm losing, uh, uh, I've increased lead time and I'm losing uh, order volume, things like that. Perfect. That answer your question? It's, uh, yeah. it's these unintended, quite, yeah, the model, not being able to model the impact of all those and see it all together. Yeah. So the, the main thing I wanted, you know, the folks on the line to hear is that, you know, in in small companies, you know, you're probably not having these sorts of complications. But in bigger ones, you know, the idea of, you know, integrated business planning, and I think the way that some are describing is a bit of a myth because it actually, uh, in many cases, it doesn't actually exist because you're not covering the entire company and you're not addressing these cross-functional trade-off decisions. So, Richard, thanks for your help on that. Thank you. I just want to close off here uh, a couple things. So, you know, to this point, I've been talking about an enterprise wide system, but, you know, the reality is that a lot of companies already have existing tools. So, you know, the way uh, Actaris is is structured, uh, you can use it more, you can use it as a plugin to address um, uh, gaps versus just replacing what you've got. Uh, also, one thing um, that's different is that it lo- you can use it on a standalone basis to do analytics. For example, do cost structure, uh, cost structure, uh, cost reduction, and and it's also structured in a way where you can phase these capabilities in over time versus all at once. So, a um, couple points to make. Um, now, there's a few things like in, in terms of where the value is. You know, there's obviously many different sources, but you know, one of the things I look at is, you know, what what value sources are there in the short term? Um, the first one is aligning costs with service levels, which I talked about before, business costs as cost reduction. And many of these, uh, a lot of the value in these things are going to re- relate to the fact that you've got somebody managing them. You know, when somebody's actually not managing things, uh, you probably uh, there's an immediate uh, improvement that can be had just by the f- virtue of the fact that somebody is being rewarded for it. Uh, but there's other costs uh, uh, associated with it. But much in the first one, it really is you know how do you how do you avoid uh, making bad decisions in the first place? And one of the things you can one of the things you can do with the tool as well is that you can build the model on a standalone basis just for the purpose of identifying cost reduction and if uh, and performance improvement and if you um uh, and from that point and then you can you can you can wrap a process around it but it's good to have the different uh, uh opportunities to, or options for how do you want to use it so in terms of next steps um you know one of the things that um i find that you know when when you hear these sorts of uh, things that we've talked about today and the different capabilities to identify which issues are we identifying? What's the potential value of resolving them? So one of the things, you know, that we're really kind of interested in is helping companies create value and meaningful improvement as well. You know, one of the things that we can also talk about is, uh, you know, during some of those discovery sessions is, you know, self-funding, you know, what, to what extent can we help you self-fund it or, you know, um, potential for um, helping to establish capabilities on a contingency basis. So let me just stop there for a second and just pause. And I'm going to um, just summarize what we've talked about. So one of the things I think that I talked about this earlier was, you know, finance strategy. I think what we talked about uh, in this session you know, is central to some of the things that Gartner's discussing are some of the main pain points and what needs to be incorporated into a uh, finance strategy. Uh, as well, I th- hopefully you'll, you now understand why we're uh, looking at this solution a little bit differently and how it compares to traditional ones. Uh, and then kind of going back to where we started, which was, you know, how we're actually driving these process improvements and where the opportunity is for uh, performance improvement. And with that,
I'm just going to turn it over for some questions. All right, Dean, let me see. Let me pull up the questions here. Can you hear me okay, Dean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Just making sure. Okay, so first question. Would this solution support other types of analytics within finance? For example, treasury and tax optimization. Uh, so for sure, I, I think that um, when you look at uh, finance uh, and fp a tools, for the most part, they don't really support um, the sort of analytics that we're talking about here. And one of the things about these analytical tools is that, you know, at, you know, the activities are all really kind of the central part of doing all the uh, optimization. So, um, yes, they do support that, you know, and it's really just part and parcel of the same model. So it actually makes tax optimization and treasury optimization far more effective. And uh, because you're distributing ownership of the model across, across the enterprise, you're using just one model. So absolutely, yes, it does support those things. Wonderful, thank you for that, Dean. All right, next question. I see that this solution has been developed for manufacturing organizations. Can it support non-manufacturing ones? Um, yeah, you know, the, one of the reasons why we're talking about manufacturing is because I, I know manufacturing well, and I know where the value sources lie, but in talking to other people in other industries that know them better than I do, uh, they say for sure, um, you know, the whole activity structure can be applied to anything really. Um, so yes, it does apply to other industries. Yeah, and then just to add a few things to that, um, with the Actaris platform, it's, it's extremely versatile. Since it's built on the Microsoft ecosystems, primarily Power BI and Excel, those are also versatile tools that can accommodate different use cases within an organization. Um, so to Dean's point, absolutely, we can help outside of uh, manufacturing. And if you want to go to our website, uh, feel free to look through some of the use cases as well as uh, customer testimonials that are outside of the manufacturing world. All right, we got uh, two more questions here, Dean, and then we can go ahead and wrap up. The, the next question is, this solution could introduce significant changes within the organization. What are your thoughts on coping with these changes? Um, they, they definitely can introduce a lot of changes. So one of the things is, um, you know, when I had the dis discussion about unwritten rules, um, so though we, um, uh, well, if you actually read a number of research studies or articles, one of the biggest problems, uh, in kind of changing anything relates to culture. Um, so um, it, it's, it's a really big issue. So one of the things before you get too deep into this is that people have to understand kind of what's in it for me and how's it gonna benefit me because you're basically asking people to unzip the kimono, so to speak. So, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, people know these, people play games with budgets and everybody knows the, the political nature of the process, but they never really talk about it. I mean. You know, you're never really going to say to your boss, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm playing games with this process. So there has to be some mechanism to protect people, and people know that they're there's uh, that they're going to be re rewarded for making the, these sorts of changes, and that there's something in it for them. So that really requires sort of a more holistic change management program, and really gets is very interconnected with anything that you'd want to be doing from a transformational perspective. Wonderful, thank you so much for that, Dean. All right, and then last question, and we can go ahead and wrap up. Uh, if anyone else has any additional questions, please feel free to include this in the chat on the side panel. So the last question, Dean, this solution looks like it would, would really or heavily rely on accurate master data. Given that so many have difficulty with this, how would you address just the idea of the master data, accurate master data? Yeah, yeah. One of the things, one of the things that, uh, that the solution does 
um, is that because it's structured around outcomes and activities, uh, in my experience, just using outcome, outcomes and activities and business processes as a central point, you can use that framework for managing master data. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been involved in master data um, management projects where you take, you know, the entire, all the fields that you're using in, a, in an organization, you can relate them to, you know, a, an activity within the framework. Uh, and thereby uh, establish accountability. So what, what you end up with, the same person that's responsible responsible for the performance of the, you know, the order to cash process uh, is the same one that's responsible for managing internal controls, the same one that's responsible for master data. It just makes life a lot easier. And this is natively built into the, the application. Um, sort of a second thing that kind of goes along with that, um, you know, where you end up having master data problems, uh, it's because of, usually because of changes that you're introducing. So especially relating to products, customers, and suppliers. I mean, because the solution is sitting on top of, you know, a Microsoft-based platform, uh, you can actually modify processes for introducing new product customers and suppliers. So in such a way, so that the master data is always entered in as, as being correct, uh, as along with, you know, incorporating it with, you know, modeling capabilities. So for example, in a new new customer, like what's the value of a new, uh, of a new customer and new product, uh, and at the same time, uh, ensuring that the master data is right. Great. Uh, we actually had two more questions that came in, Dean. So let me go ahead and uh, fire those off to you. Yeah. Yeah. The first one here is ABC required to calculate unit level cost consumption rates to multiply by the forecast sales volume and mix to solve for the capacity. Hence the projected spend. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of break that down. So is ABC required to calculate the unit level cost consumption rates? Um, well, to me, a, ABC and kind of a supply planning, there's really no difference. So um, one of the key outputs um, of, well, I'll, let me break it down into two buckets. So when I say like 60 to 80% of your cost structure, you should be able to use like this integrated supply model, activity model um, to attribute to say upwards of, you know, 60, 70, 80% of all of your direct and indirect costs to combination of products, customers, activities, and accounts. So there's gonna be some subset of your cost structure that you won't be able to do uh, do that with. So, for example, you know, maintaining your bill and material structure, or something like that, or managing your vendors. Those costs, you know, might represent you know five to ten percent of the cost structures or the costs that you would um, incorporate into a product cost. Those can be attributed back uh, after you calculate the direct costs, if you know what I mean. So one you calculate from the bottom up and the remaining you can do top-down allocations. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, and there was a, there's one more that came in um, that we'll, uh, we'll answer off, off topic. Um, but uh, it looks like my camera's not working for some reason. Um, well, I just wanted to kind of wrap up because I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Dean, for your subject matter expertise. This has been absolutely wonderful. Richard, thank you also for joining today and providing us some information and, and a real life experience and how you've been able to apply this to your organization and some of the challenges that you've faced in, in your tenure. Uh, and once again, want to thank everyone for joining today's session and staying on for a very uh, vital conversation for manufacturing companies, but of holistically even other companies that might be experiencing the same challenges. So thank you everyone for joining today. And uh, this will be recorded. So we'll be able to send this out if you want to watch it on your own time. And uh, Dean, I don't know if you have any last comments that you want to mention. Um, just thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully it was uh, 
um, of interest and applicable to uh, to your situations or your business problems. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Have a great Halloween. <laughs>